This morning, we find ourselves in the Columbia Reconstruction Hangar. This is where a five-month effort to reconstruct Columbia after the accident occurred. My name is Steve Altimus. I'm the Columbia Reconstruction Director here at KSC. Hi, I'm Pam Melroy. I'm an astronaut, and uh, I've flown on STS-92 and STS-112, and I've been here helping Steve and the rest of the team with the reconstruction. The reconstruction effort would not have been possible without the tireless efforts of the recovery teams, which included numerous federal, state, and local agencies, and led to the retrieval of 85,000 pounds, or 38% of our orbiter Columbia. Under the leadership of FEMA and in concert with EPA and NASA, the U.S. Forest Service utilized thousands of firefighters to search over 1,000 square miles of East Texas and Louisiana, most of which were walked one step at a time, shoulder to shoulder. NASA and contractor personnel participated as well from the various field centers, volunteering to provide technical support despite the cold, wet, and sometimes harsh conditions. I'd like to make a note that all the people in East Texas and Louisiana whose territory we invaded welcomed the teams and offered unparalleled goodwill and hospitality. The sacrifices made to support the recovery effort were no greater than those by Charles Krennic and Jules Myers, who lost their lives in a helicopter crash while performing search operations. It's important when we're talking about reconstruction, Pam, to, to talk about the team. As you know, this was a broad and diverse team. It involved uh, multiple agencies. It involved people from almost every center, um, NASA center, people from NASA, USA, Boeing, even the Boeing Air Safety folks from Seattle came down and participated. This really hadn't been done before on this scale. Um, it was similar to an aircraft accident, but because of the altitude and because of the size of the debris field and the condition of the debris, it was a much different task. And so we had to really go by the seat of our pants to some extent. We didn't have a cookbook or a recipe from the NTSB on how to do this reconstruction. A major effort in the reconstruction effort was to lay out a two-dimensional grid and reconstruct the orbiter in two dimensions. So what we did with the help of the NTSB, remember Clint Crookshanks, mm -hmm. our NTSB representative, we laid out this yellow grid on the floor, which is laid out in a scale 110% of the natural orbiter scale. We did that to accommodate for fractures and, and the natural growth. Um, it's not as small as it is when it's compact and put all together. So we laid this grid out, and then on top of the grid, we laid blue um, outlines of the major components of the orbit. And in this manner, I have a mock-up of the shuttle here, and what we did was we took the orbiter, it was flying north, turned it over, and then we essentially splayed it open. Then we separated the wings, and we made three wing planforms on either side. We had a, a lower surface tile, a lower surface structure, and then behind that we had the upper surface structure. And then eventually we took those layers and we were, the idea was to put the tile layer on top of the lower surface structure and see those layers in contact with each other. So about 2,700 items ended up on the grid. And out of the 83,900 items that we collected, uh, the balance of those, 81,200 or so, went into storage around the perimeter of the, of the facility. That's right. And we had about 10% of the debris was actually part of the crew module. And so we put that into a special area and uh, set that aside. Uh, the NTSB helped us set up a three-dimensional grid, which was more suitable for uh, a volume like the crew module. What you see in two dimensions um, kind of looks like chaos behind us. Uh, but when you actually represent it up to a three-dimensional model, uh, you, you can see and orient yourself a little bit better. We use a tool called EMAP. It's a, it's a waterproofing a mapping tool that we use in the OPF uh, in order to track what tiles have been waterproof for a mission. And so we developed the tool and we enhanced it for this reconstruction where we were able to show structure, uh, structure and tile, and just tile in RCC up on the three-dimensional model. What it does is it gives you a better understanding of how the two-dimensional grid is represented on the orbit. This was really an airframe failure and we chose to study um, the outer mold line of the vehicle to see where the breach might have occurred. One of the other advantages of the two-dimensional grid was the fact that we could get up close and personal with the debris. We could pick it up, we could rotate it around, look at dense things and fracture surfaces, and, and actually get in there and sample the debris also. Yeah, it seems to me that you could very easily see where there were holes, where you didn't get things back in a large area, or where you got a lot of things back. 
we recovered, you know, from the field about 85,000 pounds of debris. And we had about 2,700 items on the grid. Um, and the balance, I said, went into storage. However, of those 84,000 parts that we received back, over 40,000 of them were essentially unknown. We knew they were orbiter, but we had no idea where on the vehicle they went. This is an example of some of those parts. These are unknown electrical parts. We collected, of those 40,000 parts, the majority of them were no bigger than half a square foot. This is a, a, an example of the kind of uh, dedication that those recovery forces did in picking up these parts down to this level, this detail. And then when we got them back here, over a dozen sets of eyes looked at this part to try to identify it to where it belonged in the vehicle. It eventually ended up in unknown electrical. We broke down all these unknown parts into different um, if we knew the system, whether it was electrical, fluids, mechanical, we identified it that way. If we didn't know what system they were, we broke it down into what material it was. And so we had unknown structures, metals, tiles, uh, fabrics, plastic composites, all of those. And they're represented in these boxes behind us. I remember when we took out some of those boxes and we got all the systems that we could, the people who were experts in every different system, and we had a, an unknown party where we, we took lifted one thing out of the box and you passed it down the line and everyone got a chance to look at it one last time before we really said it's unknown. I wanted to point out here the, uh, the, the tag we have on this part. Every part that came through here, every one of the 84,000 parts that came through here got a barcode and a part number. After it went through receiving, it went to quality where that part number was, was assigned. It was A photograph was taken of it and a data record was generated which included the latitude and longitude of where that part was picked up. So every single part in this facility is documented in the Columbia Reconstruction Database. Pieces uh, came back and that were immediately recognizable to us and easily identifiable. Uh, we found a significant portion of the Ford Reaction Control System and thrusters associated with that. We found the interior window frames shown here, uh, interior window frames one through six. Um, we also found most of the PRSD tanks, the, the orbiter mid-body tanks, uh, all 30 of those tanks came back, plus the uh, maneuvering system uh, tanks, oxidizer and fuel tanks, major components of the engines, all three power heads of the shuttle main engines, as well as the turbo pumps. In fact, one of the turbo pumps weighed over 800 pounds, was buried in a hole in Louisiana that was uh, 14 feet wide and 9 feet deep. It splashed mud up a tree about 30 feet, and uh, the forest service workers in uh, Louisiana actually came upon this tree and saw this dirt and mud splattered on the tree, and they said there's got to be something in the ground. So they dug with a backhoe and recovered the turbo pump. There was a significant amount of debris, uh, large pieces that came back, but I'd say nothing bigger than an office desk. That was about the maximum size of debris that we, we got back. I think some of those big pieces of debris were the hardest ones for us all to look at initially. It was a testament to how hard Columbia fought to come home to us. And so every piece was actually a victory, and we started to see it that way. Here we're standing in front of uh, uh, an avionics display where we've displayed uh, boxes from the, the forward avionics bays 1, 2, 3A, and 3B. And the general condition of the boxes is such that they saw a lot of damage uh, generally, a lot of heating, a lot of damage. And it was kind of profound that this was the condition of most of the boxes with one exception. That's right. There was a very special exception actually, the OEX recorder which is a special box that records uh, additional data that is not downlinked to the ground. Now, this is a very interesting story because, of course, we desperately wanted to find this box. Well, we were busy here in the hangar accepting new pieces of debris from the field and trying to identify and catalog them. In the field, they were desperately hunting for this box. And we were actually able to merge our two efforts where we found all the items that had been surrounding this box that had returned to the hangar, we were able to send those the information about what had been found back to the field. They were able to plot the coordinates of where they were found, and they went back and narrowed their focus, and they were able to actually find that box. That's right, and as a result of that, we were able to take about 200 feet of usable tape off of these uh, OEX tape reels, take it back to RPS here at Kennedy Space Center, and, and retrieve that data. That data is shown in this chart behind me, was actually the link between the telemetry and the debris. It was another thread that's, that, that told the story and made it consistent where we could see the downlink um, uh, data, telemetry. We had the photographic evidence, the debris shedding events all lined up. 
and then the, the strain and pressure measurements and temperature measurements that came out of OEX turned out to be compelling evidence that, that was consistent with what we were seeing on the left-hand side. So, Pam, we talked about the debris, um, the size of the debris, the identification phase. Well, then the whole investigation shifted into the analysis of the debris and where we really got into the forensics of the hardware, where we tried to determine what the, what the debris was actually telling us. And these pieces that we, that we have here behind us, this is the uh, leading edge of the left ohms pod and the leading edge of the vertical stabilizer. And what you see here is the first case of where we start to see debris shedding off the left side, particularly wing uh, components or, or wing materials are deposited and have pitted the surface of the leading edge of the ohms pod and also the left side of the vertical stabilizer. If you took the orbiter and you were flying in this direction and you drew an arrow of the airflow from the left wing, it would impinge directly on the ohms pod leading edge and end up the vertical stabilizer. And that's, in fact, what this, uh, these pieces demonstrate for us. And what's even more compelling is that when you look on the right side of the leading edge of the vertical stabilizer, it's in much better condition than the left side. So this was not something that happened after the breakup. This was definitely a, a significant event. You know, the forensics of the hardware and, and the general macro observations of the hardware didn't only point us to the, to the, to the leading uh, cause of the failure, it also helped refute other scenarios that were being postulated during the investigation. The landing gear here is one example of that, where in fact, uh, we built up here a, a little assembly of, of several pieces of debris, including the tires, the brakes, and the main landing gear strut for the left-hand side. One of the theories that was being postulated was in fact that the, that the landing gear actually deployed at some point that, that caused the out of control condition on Columbia. But when we looked at the landing gear, we saw that there was much more chrome on the uh, upper surface of the landing gear, which would be tucked up into the wheel well. The underside, which would be exposed to the air, uh, actually was, was, was burned and charred. So we knew that the gear was protected for some period of time and that it could not have deployed. So we were able to successfully refute that scenario in this case. That's right. There were several scenarios, actually, that we were able to close off as uh, possible causes of the accident by looking at the debris. One kind of interesting thing looking here at the gear is you can compare the condition of the left tires to the right rear tires, which are set up in place behind. Uh, so you can see there's uh, quite a significant difference in their condition. Yeah, specifically, you can see that the outboard, left outboard tire saw much more heating, which is consistent with a breach in the outer surface or the leading edge of the wing. Originally, we knew that the tile on the left wing was going to be pretty interesting. So at first, what we did was we laid the tile all out on the floor. We had each one in individual bags or in boxes to protect it. The problem was we weren't getting the macro picture the way we needed to. So the team built this pretty unique setup here. It's a tile table. It's a table that has a, a full-size dimensional uh, drawing on it of each one of the 2,800 tiles on the left wing. And as we identified a tile and where it came from, and that was a whole story in itself because uh, you could identify them by uh, just millimeters of, of difference in thickness, we would lay the tile in its appropriate place on this tile, tile table mimicking the left wing. And that was able to tell us the whole story. Right. We were able to discern um, heating patterns. And uh, also, if you look here closely, the specifics to what we found that's contributors to the uh, accident or the condition of these carrier panel tiles that go along the leading edge of the wing. And they're the, they're the tiles that actually um, are the closeout between the wing tile surface and the RCC, or the reinforced carbon-carbon leading edge. All the condition of them down through panel 8 were fairly consistent in damage. This tile on, on leading edge panel 9 actually shows a, a significant difference in, in, in its makeup. It saw high heating, you can tell by the slumping of the, of the coating on the outside. It also showed deposits of metallic components from the interior portions of the wing deposited on the outer surface of that tile. So we know, in fact, that hot gas entered the wing, pressurized the wing cavity, and, and set up a vent to blow out of the lower and upper surface of the wing. That vent took those uh, molten contaminants or molten metals and, and formed a burn pattern across the lower surface of the wing, beginning here with carrier panel 9. Once it, it, the, the hot gas penetrated the leading edge, 
it cut through the leading edge spar, and you can see that the tiles actually came off in a fashion uh, that is consistent with interior wing heating. That's evidenced by the failure modes of these left-hand wing tiles, where you can see the actual rivet patterns on, on the strain isolation uh, bond to the structure. This bond failed. The tile didn't break, the actual bond failed, and that's indicative of high heating internal to the wing component that makes it fail in that manner. It's amazing because those tiles were meant to take heat from the outside, but in fact they were baking out from the inside. As we started to focus in on the left wing, we started to look in the, the leading edge reinforced carbon-carbon panels on the left wing, and specifically panels 1 through 13 down in about this region. We identified a certain amount of, of RCC. Uh, we, we initially placed it on a two-dimensional grid. But very quickly, it got to a point where it was very difficult to understand how all that went together in two dimensions. So we saw a need for three-dimensional fixtures. We developed these three-dimensional fixtures here at Kennedy um, to actually hold and display the RCC panels plus the attach fitting from the wing spot. Uh, when we put all these up in, in this manner, it started to give us additional clues in understanding the failure. You could see as we moved down from panels one, through 13, different things were occurring at different portions of the wing. One through seven, you saw generally the same type of fracture. You saw breaks along the RCC uh, apex. Uh, you saw some metallic splatter from, of aluminum and different metals. Um, but you also saw a lot of metal components still intact. The attached fittings, the uh, spanner beams, uh, some of the carrier panels. But when you move into panel eight, nine region, the metal, it was devoid of metals. Uh, you saw heavy slag buildup, buildup from uh, metals that we believe came from the from the leading edge spar and were deposited onto that uh, that surface. And then uh, you also saw high erosion, heavy erosion of the RCC uh, in the 8-9 region, which takes an incredible amount of temperature over 3,000 degrees for a period of time. That was the only place on the vehicle we saw that kind of erosion. Once you move past panel 9, and you picked up with 10, 11, 12, 13, all the way down the wing, you saw metal components start to reappear again. You saw no more slag build up. You saw metallic splatter, but no heavy slag. You saw the same type of fracture surfaces with, with no kind of erosion. So that really focused us in to look hard at panel 8. When we looked at panels 8 and 9, we found something pretty interesting in that metal slag. We were able to do some analysis and actually peel off different layers of that slag uh, so that it was uh, sort of like tree rings where it told the story in time. And the first layers of deposit were from the foil blankets and the spanners. So we could start to tell, we could tell what the sequence of burning actually inside the wing was to deposit these layers one at a time on the inside. Yeah, and, and um, a couple of days ago they completed the, uh, the uh, foam test against the mock-up of the leading edge and actually confirmed that the foam would actually break RCC panel 8. And that was our leading conclusion from the debris assessment alone, standing alone, that uh, lower surface panel 8 was, was the uh, area of, of penetration or the initial breach that caused the accident. So with the foam test, with uh, the debris talking to us, with the data from the OEX recorder and from downlink, all the stories started to converge. The debris recovered in conjunction with the reconstruction of Columbia served us well in understanding the physical cause of the accident. So what's in store for the debris after the investigation is concluded? During the course of the investigation, we uncovered interesting material properties and phenomena that were generated as a result of a hypersonic re-entry of this nature. These deserve to be studied. Our vision is to make the debris available for material science research, education, and provide a better understanding in accident investigation. By instituting a program for the long-term preservation and study of the debris, we may glean this important information from Columbia. Every mission that we fly in space brings back science and uh, new information that we didn't have before, and so each mission in and of itself is a legacy. Well, the STS-107 crew in Columbia bring back not only the science that they brought back from space, but they also have given us the gift of the Columbia debris. The Columbia debris and the things that we learn from it will become their lasting legacy for the United States.